So good afternoon, everyone. You are all very welcome this afternoon to our Sloan to Care webinar. Um, I'm Gronje Healy, and I'm delighted you've joined us for today's webinar. This Sloan to Care webinar is the first in a new series of webinars, and we are delighted to be delivering this session in partnership with the HSE. As always, we're happy to take questions or comments from you, the viewers. Just use the chat function and I will convey your remarks or questions uh, to the panel of guests with us this afternoon. Sloan to Care is about the right care, in the right place, at the right time, by the right team. In Ireland, we have a growing and ageing population. And while living longer is good news, increasing life expectancy creates create its own pressures in terms of the increasing prevalence of chronic disease. Over 1.3 million people in Ireland are living with at least one of four major chronic diseases, cardiovascular disease, COPD, asthma and diabetes. We need to respond to the changing needs of service users by changing how we deliver health care. Earlier this month, the HSE hosted the Enhanced Community Care Conference in Dublin Castle. At that event, we heard about the €240 million Euro investment in integrated community health services in line with Sloan to Care. We also heard about the importance of bringing services closer to where people live, especially for older people and people with chronic diseases. The implementation of the HSE's Enhanced Community Care Programme would not be possible without the hard work and dedication of the committed staff working to deliver health services around the country. Over 2,200 staff have been recruited or are at an advanced stage of recruitment. And we were told that an additional recruitment of 1,400 staff is planned by the end of 2022. Our webinar today is going to focus on how we can support our health professionals and future health professionals to deliver on Sloan to Care's preventative model of care and to shift left which is about supporting the implementation of the Enhanced Community Care Programme and creating sustainable ways of working across the wider HSE workforce. The large numbers of healthcare students graduating from undergraduate and graduate entry-level programmes in Ireland offer a unique opportunity to provide targeted education in the area of chronic disease prevention and management, including health behaviour change, and self-management support. Before we begin our conversations with those involved in developing, delivering and experiencing these education programmes and their impacts, I'm delighted to bring you a message from Stephen Donnelly, TD, our Minister for Health. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to, the, to uh, today's conference. I'm delighted to be able to speak with you this afternoon at the start of what I think is a really interesting Sloan to Care webinar. The title, as you know, is Supporting Our Workforce to Deliver Enhanced Community Care. Enhanced Community Care, I think, is one of the most exciting and one of the most important things we're doing in healthcare at the moment. Essentially, it's a programme of modernisation. Government has allocated a very large amount of money uh, to enhanced community care. And with that, as you'll be aware, the HSC is well on its way to hiring a full 3,500 people right across the country, 96 community health networks, and then 60 specialist teams. So what is it doing? It's increasing the overall level of healthcare provision, obviously, but critically, it's re reorienting the delivery of healthcare towards general practice, towards primary care, towards community-based services. So essentially, moving care closer to the home, moving care closer to the community, to leave the hospitals free to do what they need to do, which is uh, deal with emergency cases uh, and more complex surgical and medical uh, situations. So with enhanced community care, when this uh, new approach is fully embedded and, and we're well on the way, what we'll have is fully developed integrated care pathways across uh, every acute hospital, and across every community health area uh, right across the country. It's very, very exciting. Enhanced community care to me represents quite a radical change in how we organize our health services 
and just as importantly, it represents a radical change in how we think about healthcare. So this old model whereby somebody goes to the GP and really the only option the GP has uh, if they can't deal with the situation immediately themselves is to refer the patient um, to a hospital, refer the patient for diagnostics, refer the patient to um, a consultant, a hospital consultant. And we are, we are fundamentally challenging that and really we're turning that inside out and saying, um, you don't just default to, to a hospital. Actually, for, for most of the issues um, that people have to deal with, you can be very successfully treated uh, within the community. Now, we all know the problems of overcrowding in our hospitals uh, and in our emergency departments. We all know we're facing into a really, really serious winter. We also know that lack of access to hospital can't be solved only by the hospital. Yes, we need more hospital beds, we need more hospital diagnostics, we need more hospital clinicians. Um, but all of that on its own, of course, won't solve the problem. So a, a hugely important part of that is this program, is enhanced community care. Um, what, does it, what, what else does it do? It aims to provide patients with a better experience. It aims to provide patients with better outcomes. And of course, it aims to do this by providing care closer to the home um, for everybody, uh, but also we've targeted uh, older people and people living with uh, chronic diseases. And we've started with three chronic diseases, but um, I'm really looking forward to expanding that to more and more chronic diseases underlying conditions. I've been very fortunate to see uh, enhanced community care in operation. Um, I've seen it right across the country. Uh, I hope to see a lot more of it uh, in the coming months. Uh, hopefully I'll uh, meet some of you. What I've witnessed is an incredibly positive impact for patients. And of course, the role that our healthcare, um, our health and social uh, care services staff are playing in rolling this out and really leading the way in this, in this new way of care. The feedback I'm getting from patients is incredible. What they are telling me is that this way of treating them is life-changing. Um, from taking people out of hospital who otherwise would have had to stay in a hospital bed for a long time, to sending um, OTs and physios and other um, clinicians into people's homes, stabilizing them in their homes, letting them live in their homes, and, 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 and not just keeping them out of hospital, but really, really improving uh, their quality of life. It's, it's quite inspirational stuff. And there's an amazing sense of excitement as well from the clinicians who are rolling, rolling it out. They can see the difference that it's making um, for patients. Now, all of that is very important, but what's also really important is that we think very carefully and very strategically about how we train healthcare professionals of the future. We need to do this so that we have the workforce for enhanced community care. We need to do this to make sure that we can um, really expand the preventative work, the management of chronic disease management work in the future. I'd really like to thank and welcome the contributors to this webinar from, uh, from the health service and also our colleagues in the higher education institutions. You all have such an important role to play in the future of healthcare in our nation. We have some um, really, really good people uh, from right across the higher uh, education institutions who are contributing to the webinar here today, they're actively involved in educating our future workforce, uh, who of course we need for all of this, uh, for, all of, for all of our uh, healthcare plans as we move towards our ultimate goal, which is universal healthcare, a publicly provided healthcare system uh, that provides people with the best possible care when they need it, and that's either free or affordable at the point of uh, use. I've no doubt that the contributors today will provide an awful lot of insight. Uh, evidence from the national curriculum for the prevention and management of chronic disease uh, is being implemented across healthcare professional training programs in the HEIs. And the positive impact it's having uh, for students and for patients is being looked at. Staff working across the HEIs, I think have been really pivotal to the success of implementing the curriculum across the training programs for all of our health and social care professionals uh, since it's launched, it was launched a few years ago. Integrating this curriculum into the training programs for our healthcare professionals is essential. We need it to create the skills, create the competencies uh, in our future workforce. In fact, we're now seeing the benefits of this in our services already, where students 
and newly qualified healthcare staff are coming to work with us in the health service, they, they, they have the competencies, they have the understanding of chronic disease prevention and chronic disease management. And of course, all of this further supports the implementation of enhanced community care. This is the future of healthcare in Ireland. I'd like to take the opportunity to, first of all, congratulate you all, and secondly, thank you all, all of you from the HEIs, all of you who are helping to secure this future. Uh, you're doing it through the programs you're, deliver, you're delivering, um, you're, you're, you're doing it through innovation and through your amazing dedica dedication to uh, training the healthcare professionals of the future. So thank you so much for everything you've done. Thank you for your dedication, your professionalism, your passion, uh, your innovation, and your collaboration with all of us uh, in the healthcare service. It's greatly appreciated, and I think uh, things, are, things are looking very good for the future in healthcare here in Ireland. Thanks to all of you. And thank you for that, uh, Minister. Um, so today's webinar is about the future uh, of healthcare uh, in Ireland, uh, and that's very exciting. So let's move now to examine the training which leads to the enhanced community care uh, for those with chronic uh, diseases. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined this afternoon by Dr. Orla O'Reilly. Um, and Orla is the National Clinical Advisor and Programme Group Lead for Chronic Disease clinical design and innovation at the office of the Chief Clinical Officer, the HSC. Orla, you're very, very welcome. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Thanks, Grania. That was a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's some title, but it's great work you're doing. Orla, the focus this afternoon, as the Minister was outlining, is really on supporting you know, the workforce to deliver enhanced community care. And you and your colleagues have worked in collaboration with the higher education institutions to develop and commence the implementation of a national standard undergraduate curriculum for the prevention and management of chronic disease. Can you talk to me about the development of the curriculum, how it's preparing future uh, healthcare professionals to respond to the changing needs of service users and in effect changing the delivery of healthcare? Yes, and uh, you know I'm, I'm delighted to be here and participate in this seminar. Thank you, Grania. And I suppose this is a culmination of a piece of collaborative work that we did with the HSE and with all of the HEIs in developing this curricula. Uh, and you know we started this piece of work back in 2016. Um, the program for the integration, um, the integration care program for prevention management of chronic disease worked basically with all of the HEIs that train undergraduate healthcare professional staff to develop this curriculum and now, to, uh, now it's in implementation. It's in two parts. The first part is the Making Every Contact Count curriculum, which um, is, is for um, health behavior change, uh, training and skills for health professionals. And the second part is the self-management undergraduate uh, curriculum, which again is for training uh, undergraduates in self-management support. So Dr. Deirdre Connolly from the HEIs will be giving you a sort of a, a run through of the curriculum and an overview, but I'd just like to make a couple of points about it first. Um, it was a very innovative piece of work, I feel, because it's building sustainability into our workforce for preventive training, which we, really we hadn't got there before. We were doing postgraduate training only. And it's the young health professionals coming out. We need we need them to have this prevention skills as, as well as any other clinical skills that might get. It's the first national curriculum for prevention of this. And it's the first curriculum that the HSC worked with all of the HEIs to do one standard curriculum. I think that's a real strength is one standard curriculum. It required a lot of work on behalf of the HEIs and a lot of commitment. And again, like the minister, I'd like to thank you for, for that in the development and implementation. And it fits perfectly with the slant care objectives of shifting left and focusing on prevention. Mm -hmm. So may I have my first slide? And I'll just give you an overview then of the integrated care program and the, um, the enhanced community care program. So the next slide, please. So the Enhanced Community Care Programme is the national programme that the Minister was referring to, and it's made up really of three parts. Down here on the bottom right, you can see uh, the Chronic Disease Integrated Care Programme is kind of one of the three legs of the stool. Then similarly, Integrated Care Programme for older persons, and, and also, most importantly, the Community Care Network 
uh, strengthening, building the community care workforce throughout the country in 96 networks. So can I have the next slide, please? And as you can see, they're making every contact count and um, yeah, it's part of that. So this is a very busy slide, I won't go through it, but as you can see in the center piece there, there are the three elements of the program again, and the whole objective across the top is to shift left as, in, as determined by Sloan to Care. So that's the objective. Can I have the next slide, please? So as you said there, Grani, in the introduction, there's 1.3 million people um, in Ireland that uh, live with one of the four chronic diseases we're talking about. And the Integrated Care Programme for Chronic Disease encompasses three national clinical programmes for heart disease, for respiratory disease, and, and for diabetes. And the objectives of the programme are to maximise pre maximize prevention and to enable people to optimise their own self-management in the community and to support uh, GPs to provide that care in the community. And may I have the next slide, please? So this is the model. And as you can see there, it's in five layers, uh, five levels of service. It's to enable GP primary led primary care. And the bulk of care, as you can see there, can be in the community. So the first four of the five levels can all be delivered in the community. And the Focusing in there on level two and three, that's a, an innovative solution that we've come up with, which is the specialist ambulatory care hub. So it's an amalgam of specialist community professionals working alongside and closely with acute specialist professionals that come out from the hospital to work in the hub and build um, an integrated team in the community, providing specialist care in the community. So aspects of the model have been piloted in many different places over the last few years, so we know it works. And some of the slant care projects, innovative projects there the last couple of years were, were piloting kind of the end to end model. So the objective is to provide an end to end model for individuals with chronic disease and multimorbid chronic disease all over the country uh, to enable them to live in the community. Ne next slide, please. So just focusing a little bit in on the uh, specialist community care teams and the 30 hubs that we talked about, because I suppose this is the more innovative part of it. Um, there's 30 hubs to which will cover the country, uh, providing this type of care. They'll serve a population of about 150,000. Each will be linked to a local hospital. And the purpose is to provide timely and equitable access to diagnostics and specialist MDT uh, opinion and care in the community and I support the GP to provide patient-centered care as close to home as possible. Can I have the next slide, please? So the resources then, as the minister said, there's been a huge investment in this and we've been lucky as part of the ECC to, to be in receipt of that. So 30 fully dedicated, fully staffed uh, specialist teams, uh, additional health promotion and smoking cessation staff, 48 new integrated care consultants, which is a new thing uh, altogether, additional nursing and uh, HSCP staff to support those consultant staff, and significant uplift then in uh, acute hospital diagnostic staff uh, and community diagnostic staff to deliver direct GP access to the various diagnoses, diagnostic testing that's needed to support chronic disease. Uh, next one, please. So just to give you some idea of where we're at, where, how far we've gotten, and this, I suppose, is going for the last year and a half or a little bit longer, maybe, uh, in implementation. So the Making Every Content Count and the Self-Managed Support Frameworks were developed and published uh, back in, I think it was around 2016 or so. Uh, we then we did what we're talking about here today is with yourselves and HEIs, we, we developed these joint curricula, uh, very important, and it's great to have them embedded actually, you know, at that stage, a little bit before we, we kicked off the rest of it. Uh, the curricula are now being delivered to healthcare professional students, and we'll, we'll hear a bit about that today, so that's really encouraging. We have the GP chronic disease contract in place that started in 2021, so that's kind of layer one. So layer zero is what we've been talking about with SMS and MEC. Layer one is the GP contract, so that's in place and, and doing very well. We're currently in the recruitment of the acute and community posts, and that's progressing well, as the minister mentioned. 
the physical accommodation for these 30 hubs and the other staff involved in the ECC is being progressed and some of those have now opened and uh, getting along as quickly as possible in, in the current climate of building for that. And uh, national and joint govern national local joint governance structures have been established all over the place. And clinical leadership uh, has been established, the guidelines, the pathways, the estates, the equipment specifications, the ICT specifications and the KPIs, all that sort of, you know, background work that, that's been done. And it's a fully funded program now with over 1400 posts for chronic disease. So this, this is really a, a big development. So that's the end of that's the end of my slides. But but just to say, you know, we've done a good bit here. And I think we're really now on the cusp of something truly transformational for the health service. We have a fully funded national program, which mm. comprises kind of three essential elements in the ECC, one of them being chronic disease. We have 1400 posts, which is, you know, extraordinary. We have an integrated model based on best practice, which puts the patient at the centre of the service. And I really think that this and, and focuses on prevention and, you know, behaviour changes outlined and support. And I really think it's a it's a really important step in achieving the slot to care objectives. And one of the essential elements in that <clears throat> is what you're helping us do, which is kit out our health professionals, particularly our new young health professionals coming on with the skills that they take this as second nature, then it's not kind of an add-on. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah. That's great. That's great, Orla. I think it is an amazing story. And in many ways, it sort of puts wheels on a lot of the theory that's been talked about Salonche Care. This is it in practice. This is the ability to ensure that people are close to home, getting the treatment with the specialists and leaving the emergency departments to do what they should do best, which is the really urgent emergency care. And it seems to me that, you know, supporting the GP, supporting diagnostics, all of this is, um, it's a great story. And, and as you say, it's centered on prevention, lifestyle improvement, giving patients self-management skills and the confidence to better manage their own chronic conditions. And really for the rest of this afternoon, we're going to focus on the curriculum, the students, how they have found it, and some of the outcomes for patients. So look, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you again later on in the webinar uh, during the panel. Thank you so much, Orla. And finally, just to say to you and all the teams, you know, it's not gone uncommented that this was all happening during COVID and in the immediate, immediate aftermath. So again, I think that needs to be said and, and people congratulated on it. Thank you so much, Orla, for, for joining us. Thank you. So turning now to another really important aspect of uh, these whole developments, and that is the issue of patient voice and patient experience. I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, uh, Denise Dunn. Denise Dunn is Operational Lead Integrated Care Programme on Chronic Disease in the Galway City Ambulatory Hub. Denise is working in one of these new specialist ambulatory care hubs that Dr. Riley has just told us about. Denise, you're very welcome. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Denise, can you tell us a little bit about your new community specialist teams? Yeah, great. Thanks a million, Gronia, um, for inviting me to contribute firstly to the webinar. And I'm delighted to represent, I suppose, op leads in general around the country. And it's great to have the ear of the HEIs. Um, I suppose I've seen it now um, first practice with a lot of our clinicians, you know, having gone through um, the um, educational system. And it's great to have it embedded at that level. So I suppose I'm one of the uh, new 30 uh, operational leads that are in post to lead out the implementation of the new specialist services within the community hubs. Um, my team, I suppose the teams cover the three networks. So currently here in Galway City, my hub covers networks four, five and six. So we're looking at approximately 150,000 uh, people. Uh, we have three specialities within the hubs. So we cover cardiovascular disease, respiratory and diabetes. Um, and each of those teams come with highly efficient and proactive and very innovative staff, you know, 
And it's I just like to take the opportunity to thank my staff because we've had they've really embraced the change since we've tr tried to roll out stuff here in Galway anyway, locally. So the respiratory multidisciplinary team um, who are functioning interdisciplinary as well. And I think that's an important point. And I think they gain a lot of that during their uh, undergraduate uh, learning and in the postgraduate learning as well. So my respiratory team comprises of about five physiotherapists um, all the way down from uh, CS physio. We have four clinical nurse specialists. Um, we have also, we're very lucky to have an integrated care respiratory consultant that will be coming on board hopefully later in the year. We're just currently recruiting for that. And that person will form the clinical leadership to that team. Uh, currently, we're being heavily supported by our acute consultants, which is great here in Galway. Um, my diabetic multidisciplinary team comprises of about three clinical nurse specialists as well. We've got six dietitians, so both senior and staff grade, and then a huge team of podiatrists. So we have about three. We have a senior, a clinical specialist and a staff grade uh, working in the diabetes area. And then obviously we have the cardiology MDT and that comprises of about five nurses. We have a physiotherapist, a um, cardiac rehab coordinator and a 0 0.5 psychologist, you know, psychologists um, like hen's teeth now trying to get a psychologist. Yeah. So we're delighted to have have those on board as well. Like I said, I've alluded to our respiratory consultant. We've also been very lucky over the last two weeks to get Dr. Susan Connolly. So she has started in her new post as consultant cardiologist with us here in Galway. Um, and Susan comes with a vast experience experience in preventive cardiology and I suppose specifically cardiac rehab um, experience which is great because we all know that if we can get some lifestyle modification for these patients um, specifically I suppose the cardiovascular disease patients we can hopefully eliminate almost 80 percent of, of MIs and heart attacks um, in the future um, yeah. knowing that obviously cardiovascular disease is preventable sure, um, sure. yeah so it's been it's been great. really exciting yeah I got super Denise and you know it's great to see these hubs being staffed up and, and all the right people getting into the right uh, positions. You mentioned their prevention and self-management is a message that you're, you're key to highlight in the services. Can you tell us a little bit about that, how it's happening in practice? And, and maybe we could go into the two videos that you have uh, prepared for us to yeah. explain this. Yeah, exactly. So I suppose um, we were delighted um, as a group to see that prevention was actually called out in the title of the model of care. I think that was something, you know, that we hadn't seen in Ireland. We very much deal with the chronic disease after the fact. So we were very much delighted that it was there. Prevention and self-management should always be the cornerstone, really, when you're dealing with a, a chronic disease population uh, and not just managing cardiac or um, cardiovascular disease. You know, it comes into play when you're dealing with the diabetic the COPD sure. patient, you're asthmatic. So I suppose for that reason, our multidisciplinary teams function in a very interdisciplinary way, and they have quite a strong focus on patient education. And I suppose empowering the patient to self-manage their own condition. We want sure. to move the ownership back onto the patient. Mm -hmm. If you can get them um, feeling like they, they kind of have a strong focus in their care plan, yeah. um, and that starts from the GP, you know, uh, aligned to the GP contract. They have their annual input with the GP um, once a year or the practice nurse and it starts from there really mm -hmm. so we have various um, self-management programs you know educational programs running within the hubs I suppose the one that comes to mind first is our pulmonary rehab program because that's up and running so we have those functioning now in Galway and also the Balanus Low Hub since approximately May time uh, and that's delivered again by our multidisciplinary team so led out by Neve Dignan our uh, clinical specialist here in Galway and then obviously heavily supported by our CNSs so Ruth Kelly Philip and Edom and Kira Sherlock uh, and they're effectively GP uh, direct referrals to the service um, coming into the the main portal for our referrals within the hub and I suppose the best way to describe how pulmonary rehab works I think is to look at um, we have a nice pulmonary rehab video here that let's shows that. I suppose, pulmonary rehab in action okay let's have a look at that now then thank you Physiotherapists at Our Lady of Lourdes Hospital in Drogheda are using technology to deliver the world's first virtual home-based exercise and education programme for patients with chronic lung conditions. The programme has led many patients to say they've seen an improvement in their quality of life. Jog, jog. At Our Lady of Lourdes Hospital in Drogheda, a virtual pulmonary rehabilitation class is underway for patients who have COPD, a chronic lung condition. This is the first of its kind worldwide. 
patients are assessed virtually via video link and if they are enrolled then they log into a live exercise class the patients um, are alleviated of the burden of traveling to classes the cost the time and even the stress of looking for a parking space it's also provided a social outlet for many patients they see the therapist delivering the exercises, but they also get to see all the other participants. So I said there is that social interaction, so the patients are able to chat to one another and share their experience, especially if living with a chronic respiratory condition during a pandemic. COPD patient Pauline O'Neill is taking part in the programme, and like many other patients, she has seen huge improvements in her quality of life. I know when you used to say pulmonary rehab and you sometimes I can't walk, you know, I can hardly talk. But like two weeks into it and you want to keep going, you know, because the end of it, you're a different person. You have a different life. You can get out, you can walk, you can talk. You know, it is fantastic. The programme is now being used as a national template and many hospitals around the world are eager to follow suit. We wrote the national guidelines so that other areas can replicate our model and learn from our experience. Sinead Hussey, RT News, Drada. That's a really strong testimonial there. Yeah, isn't it, really, really, Super. really powerful. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose it's just to thank um, that team, so yeah. Cathy and Magella's team, and indeed right. the National Clinical Programme. They've been instrumental in providing some of the guideline documents that then we have yeah. rolled out. Brilliant. So all of these programmes as well work in a hub and spoke type. So you're moving in and out from the, the hubs itself. Another one that we have up and running is our um, diabetes self-management. So people may be very aware of Desmond. Um, and this is a group program that helps patients, I suppose, understand how different foods, activities, how they all affect their blood glucose. Let's, let's um, have a look at the patient exactly. testimony yeah. for this then. OK, thank you. The program I found it to be very interesting, but making us aware of that's where I started to, 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 to read the, 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 the sugar and the hydrocarbons and the fats and all this type of thing. And the, the, the type of oils we use in the cook and, you know, so, yeah, I found it very, very helpful. It has, in fact, quite a, a, a changed my way of life. I, within uh, the first year, I lost two stone in weight. I have to run my own cooking and buy my own vegetables and meats and everything. I'm very conscious. I rarely pick up a packet of seen in the supermarket. I generally be looking at the sugar content, the fat content. So I'm much more aware about I, the veg and cook my own veg and potato and that type of thing. So yeah, I'm much more, more aware of it and it's working out well for me. I found it so beneficial. We've recently started a local active retirement group in our area and have requested that Olive maybe would come and give us a, a talk and, which would be a preventative talk rather than a cure, you know, to, to prevention to me would be every bit as critical as, as important, as beneficial, as um, a, a, a cure, to, you know, after the event, after your diagnosis. So again, another strong testimony and the, just that awareness, as you say, of for him, you know, he doesn't pick up anything in the supermarket without having a look to see, yeah. you know, how much of this is fat and carbohydrate and what can I eat and what can't. So really, really strong. I know, you know, that 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 going hand in hand with this, this supporting self-management is, is core of your service. But the making every contact count is another kind of core, goes hand in hand with this. Will you talk a little bit about how you've implemented that in your teams? Yeah, so I suppose, um, as Dr. O'Reilly alluded to earlier, it's it's rolled out now for, for a good few years. So most of our staff, all of our staff, as they come on board, are MEC trained. Uh, we have the support now as well of the health promotion officers. So they do the MEC training piece online via HSE land. And then they get the practical component from the um, health promotion officers, which is great. Then some of the staff have advanced behavior change training. Uh, they've done a lot of that as postgraduate. You know, some are newer graduates that are coming through the system 
systems within Ireland now at undergraduate undergraduate level that ha- are encouraging behaviour change because really it's more of an ethos. Um, mm-hmm. So during the consultations then that the patients have, it's about, I suppose, asking them about their lifestyles, asking them about their behaviours. And that's the fantastic thing with, with the ECC uh, programme. So across the board, not just the chronic disease programme, it's really about kind of um, enhancing the community services to the level that we can now signpost but that is people in post to to I suppose help the patient move from contemplating the change to actually planning and then implementing the change whatever that that might be so some examples that we have in the hub that are really helping like I said we have our health promotion officer which has been a huge benefit and they are uh, one whole time equivalent per hub so they assist with things like smoking cessation um, our healthy eating Mm. um, you know physical activity they do loads of things like that we have our dietitians and they can offer one-on-one consultations but they can also offer group consultations um, and they're looking at some of the pre-diabetes programs but also the Desmond program for our actual type 2 diabetics we have the psychologist like I said which is a real boost to cardiac rehab uh, but the big thing is obviously it's a positive start we just need you know a lot more support from um, psychological um, assistance into the hubs obviously across yeah. all disease profiles as well and then um, we we have our peer support. So we have the Living Well with Chronic Disease or Chronic Illness. And this is a program, the Living Well program. You may have mm-hmm. heard of it. Mm-hmm. And where we're utilizing the Living Well program is when a patient finishes their cardiac rehab, their Desmond or their pulmonary rehab, we try and get them then engaged um, with a follow up, which is the Living Well. Mm-hmm. And really, that's where they find out loads of useful tips, uh, guidance, um, Uh, kind of advice and support from people who are actually living with the disease so these programs are led out by a peer you know someone who knows what it is to to have lived with the condition Mm. so that's been really really powerful Mm. Um, and our self-management support um, coordinators um, can assist with that as well around the country but they've been hugely hugely powerful Mm. Um, and really that's that's kind of it's about encompassing it all so trying to think about the patient as a holistic patient as well exactly that we're meeting their needs and trying to empower them really to take ownership at whatever stage they're at whether it be at the level that you know they're becoming hypertensive or we know that they are putting on weight Mm. all the way to the trajectory of the end stage of the chronic diseases and that's where we see ourselves sit really fantastic I mean it's it's clear from from the testimonials that it's great work it's clear from you and you're passionate about it that it's it's working and you're so happy to be involved in it so look Denise thank you so much for joining thank you so much for bringing the testimonials and I think for really bringing it to life what is actually happening uh, in the hubs and the benefits that 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 uh, patients are seeing so thanks very much for joining us this afternoon we 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 really appreciate it thank you thanks Gronia Um, I'm going to move on now to an overview of the content of the National uh, Undergraduate Programme itself. And I'm really happy to be joined by Professor Deirdre Connolly, who is Professor of Occupational Therapy with Trinity Centre for Health Service and St. James's Hospital. And Deirdre is Chair of the National Working Group for the implementation of the National Standard Curriculum for Chronic Disease Prevention and Management, and indeed was a core member of the National Working Group established in 2016 to actually develop the curriculum. Uh, Deirdre, a long introduction to you, but you know, great work you're doing and delighted you could join us uh, this afternoon. Could you start maybe by telling us why you got involved with this initiative to develop a standard undergraduate curriculum for chronic disease management? Yeah, sure. I suppose, you know, my clinical background, as you say, is occupational therapy and uh, Occupational therapists, I suppose, would have a long standing practice really working with people uh, with chronic diseases and and very much um, from the perspective, probably more from the management. So once people develop their chronic diseases. Uh, So certainly, uh, you know, I've had a lot of experience with and, you know, the minister alluded to uh, neurological conditions, you know, going beyond even the the kind of the focus of the current uh, mech and, and self-management support and then within Trinity itself my my research is very much focused on how do we develop uh, a meaningful self-management support interventions for people with chronic diseases uh, and, and my teaching 
at an undergraduate and postgraduate is, is also very much focused mm. on, on mm. chronic disease management. Very good. So all paths so all leading paths collided. Yeah, yeah. Very good. And, and yeah. I suppose when I heard about this, when it was first presented, I thought, God, you know, this is such a fantastic opportunity for educators to work with people who are, are working, you know, with patients yeah. within services. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, as educators, we feel we're, we're working in isolation, developing yeah. modules, uh, and it's kind of removed from the reality of practice. So here we yeah. had, you know, everybody coming together. Uh, Super. And, uh, Super. So, so, so Super. So, so with that in mind, then, tell us about the curriculum and, and how was it developed? OK, so, so it was developed, you know, as, as previous speakers have said, it, you know, over a three and a half year period. Um, there, there were a lot of groups involved. Uh, so we had at a national level, we had a, a, a steering group chaired by uh, Dr. O'Reilly, uh, and that really provided oversight, I suppose, to the project and, and funding and resources. Yeah. And then we had the National Working Group, and that was chaired by uh, Professor Eileen Savage uh, in, in UCC in, in nursing. And, and that was the group really that developed the, the two curricula, the, the Make Every Contact Count and, and the self-management support. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we would have met on a monthly basis over that three-year period uh, in, in terms of developing the curriculum. We also had on that committee, which again is vital, uh, we had patient representatives. Uh, and so we had uh, people who were lived experience of living with asthma and diabetes. So their input was invaluable. And then the, the third kind of group of people involved was that each of the members on the national working group uh, within their universities and higher education institutions would have uh, been part of what we call the local working groups. And they were made up of the educators across the different disciplines. Uh, and again, we met on a regular basis um, along with students Again, the student voice, you know, these were the people who, A, the educators delivering the program, but obviously the students who, who we wanted to really, you know, get on board uh, with, the, with the curriculum and the content uh, and, and our future workforce. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so again, they were very involved in providing feedback on a regular basis. Great. Every draft of every learning unit mm -hmm. that was developed, we would have got feedback. Right. You Great. Know, so let's a, have a let's have a look at the two curriculum then. Sure. So if we can put up the first slide there, Tom. So the the, the curriculum is made up of two two um, curricula or, or modules, if you like. So the the first one is as as we were saying earlier, it's very much around health behaviour change, uh, and it's the make every contact count, uh, and that consists of four units. The first two really looking more about, you know, defining what is health, the determinants of health and, and also theories of health behavior change. Also really getting the students to think about their own uh, health and, and, and behavior, lifestyle behaviors uh, and, and the impact that has on, on their kind of day to day um, uh, health and, and activities. And then the second two units are very much uh, geared on developing skills for health behavior change. So the, the unit three there is around communication, effective communication skills with their patients. And then uh, the, the last unit is uh, the brief intervention skills. So making every contact count for, for physical activity, diet, mm -hmm. uh, alcohol related uh, health behaviors. Uh, and that was actually done in combination. So a lot of our educators would have been trained in training students to develop the skills, but it was also, which was important, the same training unit that HSE staff were also availing of. Mm -hmm. So there, there was that alignment and overlap, which was important. Yeah. And then the second curriculum there, Tom, if you don't mind moving on to the self-management support curriculum, um, and uh, this one was it consists of five units, learning units. And again, we moved from the theoretical um, uh, learning about the principles around self-management support onto kind of uh, skill-based development. So it really looked at how students could be person-centered. That was a core part of both curricula. 
communication, effective communication skills, problem solving skills. Uh, and then the final the unit really looked at the kind of the bigger picture. You know, what were the important elements of the uh, health service delivery and organization for supporting um, healthcare professionals to deliver self-management support. So just to say both of those curricula are available, Grania, online and in the HSE. Great. And excellent resources available to support educators to deliver that as well. So, so it's all available online. That's great. Yeah. So that's, that's great. That's... And, and dear, you know, the, the curriculum was developed. Uh, it's been implemented and trained. Your sense then of, you know, what are the, what have been the key factors for its success? I think your involvement of the patient experience is obviously really important. Yeah. All those top people across multidisciplinary fields. What's your mm -hmm. sense of the key success factors? Yeah, I think, I think there's two elements that, that I would pick out and myself, you know, this is again, my experience. Yeah. I think the, 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 biggest and most important was the commitment that people gave to this Grania. Mm. Um, you know that it was such a unique collaboration but the the motivation to to continue as I said three and a half years yeah um, you know educators and, and the HSE staff patients student everybody was giving of this within their own time um, and you know there was the attending meetings there was developing mm. the content because we all did that outside of the meeting times uh, there was getting, you know, feedback, there was proofreading. So there was huge commitment to it. And, and But that was based on the motivation. People really wanted this to work yeah. and, and yeah. they wanted to see it in practice. Yeah. You know, there wasn't a token uh, modules that were developed and then never actually used. Mm. So, so, mm. That, so that was huge. Great. And then I think it was the collective expertise, mm. you know, that we had the expertise of educators, expertise of, 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 of HSE staff, patient expertise uh, and, and, and the student expertise and, and really, you know, bringing that together, integrating it. And I think when you look through the curriculum, it's really obvious yes that 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 made a, a huge difference in, in in what we developed great great they, they were and quiet. and and where is the curriculum being implemented now right across the country all the health professional training spots yes yeah to to to, to, to different degrees obviously this is something that we, we we don't have data on it but we do like as you're saying i'm the chair of the the national mm. implementation group uh, and on that group we do have again great representation from the heis uh, maria o'brien she's been hugely instrumental in driving this i can't say enough about maria yes she's been helpful uh, to us as well in putting really this together can't. yeah um, yeah and uh, and so it really yeah no it is being it, it, you know most of the disciplines and the healthcare professionals we wanted to target and include it are are including it. Um, you you know we had to make sure it was very flexible this curriculum exactly because, yeah. you know as, as Dr O'Reilly said it was one curriculum mm. um, so it, it is being delivered across the healthcare programs mm. but also what I think is really exciting it's also been taken up by non-healthcare professional programs so mm. other health related yes yeah so, so health promotion yeah. uh, health and leisure um uh, uh, have really embraced it and using elements so i think this mm. there's mm. just huge potential yeah developing yeah. developing this further yeah so we really Brilliant. you know we need to continue mm. as i say mm. um students need to see they need to have opportunities go on sure. placement see yeah. this in practice yeah you know, that's going to okay, be and then we, we we may get to look at that perhaps later in, sure. in the panel so dude in terms of we have some case studies yes that you've prepared for us a number of videos um the first one is is uh Fanula, who's a final year farm student so just speak us into this if you will before we play it sure i think what's really nice about this case study is that you can see from the students perspective how you know the learning the appreciation that she developed through this mm. curriculum and the importance mm. again of that patient centeredness yeah and then lovely example of how you know a real live example of how she used it in practice yeah brilliant okay so tom we can play this first one now please so I'm really pleased to be joined by Fanula Hochter. And Fanula is a final year student in pharmacy in UCC. Fanula, you're so welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Kiranya. Um, 
would you tell me a little bit about your experience of the learning you've been through and in particular around the making every contact count element of the curriculum which you've been through as part of your training to date? So I suppose the making every contact count approach was focused on earlier on in the MFARM programme um, and what comes to mind to me is the topic of smoking cessation and um, where we did an interactive workshop on that topic and I suppose it's recognised that pharmacists have an opportunity to drive positive health behaviour change in this area and um, I suppose my key takeaways from that were how to broach the conversation I suppose a delicate conversation around health behaviour change and um, in that the conversation has to be patient-centred and um, with active listening skills being being core to that as well and um, something else I suppose that I remember about it is that patients aren't always in a position uh, to make a health behaviour change and that I suppose is where the value of the making every contact count really kind of hit home with me where every interaction we have with patients gives us an opportunity to have a positive impact on their health and their and their um, well-being I suppose. Mm. So Fanula you'd be dealing then with somebody who you know they may not be in with you to talk about their smoking habit yeah. but because you're dealing with them you know in your own professional capacity this idea of making every contact count so you know you're asking about their smoking they're telling you yeah they've been trying to give up for 20 mm. years that idea of you being able to intervene so that you can help them move towards you know, giving up smoking, being healthier, and perhaps even uh, lessening the condition that they may be presenting uh, uh, in front of you for. Uh, it sounds like it has a very positive impact on people's overall uh, health uh, and and well-being. Talk a little bit about the the kind of the training and and the grounding in raising lifestyle behaviour. It's not always the easiest thing to raise with someone, particularly if they're not expecting you to raise it with them. No, no, I suppose, as I, as I mentioned, it's definitely a, a delicate conversation to broach. And I suppose patients have to often be in the mindset to, to be open to such a conversation. Mm -hmm. So I suppose it's about kind of recognising the opportunity when it's right to kind of bring, bring it up or, or maybe, you know, maybe you leave it to another time where it's more appropriate as well. Yeah, yeah. so you're judging that on your own kind of professional experience. Experience, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, just, very good. Very yeah. good. And of course, an element around behaviour change is around self-management. And I know that part of your training is around self-management and, and part of your curriculum. Talk to me a little bit about how self, the self-management elements of your training, how it helps you to develop your skills. I suppose the, the concept of then of self-management support was kind of focused on later on in the MFARM curriculum um, in the management of all chronic conditions. Um, with, I suppose, the key ones that we focused on being uh, in the management of people who have diabetes and in also in asthma. Um, I suppose we did interactive workshops surrounding the key skills that these patients require to manage their, manage their conditions. So I suppose not the intricacies behind the medicines, but actually just the everyday, you know, what they need to do to manage their condition. Um, so I suppose the, the workshop on diabetes focused on using glucometer devices or use of the insulin pens and then the ones um, on asthma focused on using peak flow meters and then the various inhaler devices. Um, I suppose for me, I found the asthma workshop to be really helpful um, because I had no prior experience of using inhalers, um, I think. And mm. I suppose I had no understanding of what it was like to live with asthma day in, day out and getting a chance to use the devices and the peak flow meters gave me an opportunity or I suppose an insight into the lived experience of, mm. um, of, of patients with asthma. Mm -hmm. And of course, during the training and the workshops is one thing, but mm. you have also had a chance to integrate this into your uh, clinical practice as part of your clinical uh, placements. Maybe tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, um, so Grania, I've just completed my final um, appell placement for, for pharmacy. Um, well, done. Busy, well done, well done. A, a busy uh, pharmacy in Cork City. Um, and I suppose I was given lots of opportunities to talk to patients uh, with all different types of chronic conditions. Um, one that springs to mind is um, one day a, a, mo a mother and her young daughter came into the pharmacy with a prescription with, for two new inhalers. Um, and the daughter had just been newly diagnosed as asthmatic. 
Um, so when we were running through how to use the inhalers and the and the spacer device that it comes with too, um, I mentioned the idea of developing a personal asthma action plan. And um, so the mum thought this was a really good idea. And um, so under the supervision then of my senior preceptor, and um, we developed this plan with her. Um, and we suppose we focused on things like what each inhaler was for, how to use them, and um, how to recognise signs that you know the asthma may not be that well controlled, and then I suppose what to do in the event of an asthma attack. Very good. Um, and I suppose then later on in the subsequent months, um, the mum came back in to collect um, repeat prescriptions, um, and she informed me that her daughter was doing really well, um, and she had no exacerbations at all. So I suppose that's I found it to be really rewarding, you know, to know that the time you put in to talk to patients with these conditions and give them, I suppose, the knowledge and the skills to support themselves. Um, I suppose it's just really beneficial. I suppose, it, yeah, it was really rewarding, to be honest, yeah. Sounds like it. Well, well done. So look, congratulations to you, Fnula, on uh, almost completing uh, your training. You've done your placement, so that's fantastic. And I really think that that example you gave us of, you know, both the little girl and the mother being more confident in managing a mm. chronic condition, certainly the learning that you've been through on the curriculum and the chance to apply it uh, has really made a difference uh, to both uh, uh, that child and her mother. So thank you very much for joining us, Nula, and the best of luck in the completion of your studies. Thanks very much, Brian. Well, great to see Fanula's uh, satisfaction in the outcomes for her patients there and really does demonstrate, I think, how the curriculum can be taken into clinical practice and the obvious benefits uh, to uh, the patients that she's dealing with. We have a second case study, uh, Deirdre, and maybe you'd talk us in uh, to this one, please. Yeah, sure, Grania. I suppose this is looking from the other perspective now. So we have a, a lecture uh, in, in dietetics from the University of Limerick, Dr. Anne, uh, Dr. Anne Griffin. And so she's going to talk about her experience of implementing uh, the, the curriculum and also, I suppose, highlighting some of the features of the curriculum that do definitely facilitate student learning. Great stuff. Thank you. We'll play the second one now. I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Anne Griffin, and uh, Dr. Griffin is a lecturer in dietetics in the University of Limerick. Um, Anne is going to talk about her personal experience and the experience of some of her colleagues in implementing the Making Every Contact Count curriculum with students in UL. Anne, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, and would you tell us a little bit about the particular student cohorts you've been working with in UL for starters? Hi, Grania, and thank you very much for the invitation today. Yeah, I've been working with students since 2019, so dietetic students and physiotherapy students in the School of Allied Health. So that's five years now that we've been able to implement um, the Making Every Contact Count curriculum into the education of those students. Very good. And tell us how well students engage with the curriculum. You know, they engage quite well. Um, so they're somewhat hesitant at the notion of role play, which I think something we all share <laughs> is this idea of taking on either the part of the healthcare professional when they aren't actually, you know, they're not qualified or graduated yet. Mm. Um, uh, or the role of a patient, especially when they might not share the experiences that some of those patients have. But as with the way the workshop has been set up, you know, and there's iterations through developing the skills, they relax into those roles and they start mm -hmm. to concentrate then and they learn the value of the, um, the five A's really and that strategy towards a brief intervention. So Anne, will you talk a little uh, about what the five A's are? They seem to be central to the programme. Okay, so Grania, the five A's are ask, advise, assess, assist and arrange. Okay, so so the the it seems to me from listening to uh, Fanula, whom we spoke to earlier on, building a rapport is really uh, crucial. So maybe talk with us a little bit about the, the curriculum and some of the key elements uh, of it. Yeah, so the curriculum provides benefits to students learning about patient centred care and that really is, I suppose, the, the emphasis of the curriculum and teaching the students. Um, so, as you mentioned, it builds rapport. There's a lot of emphasis on that, you know, those conversations that we have with patients when they come into the room with us and how we help them feel relaxed and more able to 
um, continue a conversation with us. So the introductory or introductory or initial practice skills um, include that active listening and reflecting, um, and that really benefits the students uh, as we have seen then when they go out onto their practice placements and the you know when they're using these skills actually in their therapeutic approaches then as well. Yeah. yeah. And I think that, you know, active listening, it's not something that comes naturally to most of us. So the idea of professionals, young professionals being trained, learning that very early on in their training, I would imagine that is a huge bonus to building a lifelong approach to their practice. It is, Grania, it really is. And, you know, being able to um, practice it in the safe space of the classroom, if you like, even if it is through role play. And it's also um, that experience as they move forward within their programs and onto their practice placements, it's almost um, a touch point, you know, at, you remember back to when we talked about making every contact count and the importance of building rapport and how we put the patient at the centre of our care and reminding them of the five A's and those skills to guiding conversations with, um, with our patients. So it, it sounds like, you know, you've enjoyed teaching the curriculum, you've had a positive response uh, from the students. What do you think you need to continue to integrate this curriculum going into the future? Yeah, so going into the future, um, a couple of things that, you know, as I reflect back over the last five years and um, working with the students on the Making Every Contact Count, um, experiencing challenging scenarios it's touched upon in the workshop but i suppose nothing prepares you for those difficult conversations that yeah. you might have with patients um, and you know students remain apprehensive about that until really they've had a real experience i suppose and they can reflect on that um, and there are the tools within the workshop you know to allow students to reflect on how they are using the approaches and the brief intervention skills that they are taught within the curriculum um, for, for me as a teacher, having good group facilitation skills is very important to yes. the students on track with, you know, with the learning objectives of um, making every contact count because, uh, you know, no more than any of us, we like to default into a fixing role where really this, the idea of brief interventions is a guiding role. So helping our patients to consider um, their lifestyle and um, approaches to maybe uh, changes that they can make within their lifestyle towards better, better um, or more appropriate behaviours uh, to value their health. Yeah. So, um, and then I suppose just an update or a refresher for ourselves so that we don't become too complacent in our teaching role of making every contact count. So just that we ourselves are keeping our skills up um, within brief intervention. Mm, very good. And of course, all of this, the making uh, every contact count really fits in with the modern thinking of self-management of chronic diseases, encouraging the, the person with the condition, condition to better manage both their meds and also being able to see whether or not they are managing the condition well enough and then seeking support from professionals if they're worried and, and that's not working. So in many ways, the making every contact count, it's for the patient, it gives them a sense that they are taking responsibility for their own health, but it also, I think, sharpens, and I like the idea of the role play with the students, where they get a chance to actually interact with the human being and say, so how does that feel? And do you understand that? Or will I show you how to do that again? So uh, I think the role play, they, they, they may be a bit reluctant to start, but it sounds like it's a really important uh, central learning tool uh, uh, for this. And thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Sounds like you really enjoy uh, the teaching. So uh, many more years uh, of success with it. And thanks so much for joining us this Thank afternoon. So again, I think satisfaction from a teacher so evident there. Our third case study, Deirdre, is about interprofessional application uh, of the training. So would you introduce it for us now, please? Yeah, sure. Um, this comes from my, my own uh, institution, from Trinity College. And um, we... Um, I suppose we've always felt, particularly the self-management support curriculum Gronio was a fantastic opportunity for uh, to do interprofessional learning uh, because self-management is not just done by one 
health professional. Uh, and so um, th this really provided very concrete opportunities to, to, to develop this. So this is a, a, a niche professional learning experience that, that we developed uh, with pharmacy, occupational therapy, physiotherapy and speech and language therapy um, students. Uh, so, so you'll hear about that. Great, thanks very much. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Emer Barrett, Assistant Professor in the Discipline of Physiotherapy in Trinity. And today in this brief presentation, I'm going to outline how we have integrated elements of the national curriculum on self-management support for chronic disease into an interprofessional learning unit that we deliver in the Faculty of Health Sciences. So firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge my colleagues listed on this slide who are co-developers of the unit. So in this unit, students from physio, pharmacy, speech and language and OT take part in an online interprofessional unit delivered over four weeks. Students are allocated to small interprofessional groups and they're provided with case study materials which centre around a patient with Parkinson's disease who is admitted to hospital with a recent deterioration. In a video testimonial, a patient also talks about their experience of living with Parkinson's disease, giving further insight. So following review of the case study materials, the, each student contributes to a discussion board within their group and answers an assigned question. And the, the questions center around the role that the different professions play in the management of this patient. In step three, students complete an interprofessional task in which each group designs a weekly diary, which is provided to the patient on discharge from hospital. And the diary has to address the patient's concern about how they will integrate all of the different therapy regimes and medication advice into their daily routine, while at the same time being able to manage their fatigue and having some time and energy left to pursue their own leisure pursuits. And then in the final step, students answer a series of short reflection questions. So how do we integrate self-management into this? So firstly, we do it through the approach. So by developing this as an interprofessional learning task, we're modeling the interprofessional teamwork approach that is advocated in self-management support. Students learn to appreciate the different role each profession has to play, and they also get an opportunity to work as an interprofessional team to collaborate on creating a self-management resource for their patient. The case study materials encourage a, a person-centered approach by emphasizing how the patient's condition impacts on their daily life. And additionally, in the video testimonial, the patient talks about the importance of seeing the whole person and the importance of the language used by and the attitudes of health professionals. In the group task, students collaborate to design a self-management tool in the format of a weekly diary that will support the patient to manage their condition and to develop self-monitoring skills regarding their symptoms, medication management and overall health status. So students therefore develop an understanding of the complexity of managing a chronic disease with input from multiple different disciplines. And additionally, they also have to consider elements of health literacy to ensure that the diary is presented using language and formats that are suitable for their patient's ability. And finally, in the reflection, students are encouraged to reflect on the skills that a healthcare professional um, must develop in order to support patients and also to reflect on how interprofessional teamwork can impact on patient outcomes. So I'd just like to thank you very much for your time and, and attention. And thank you very much, uh, Emer Barrett. Um, the, the, uh, I mean, I think that interprofessional is so important and as you say, allowing a multitude of uh, disciplines to um, uh, uh, to come together. Um, we're, we're running up against time here at the moment and I'm, I'm anxious to go to the panel. So I, I think we'll move straight into our panel uh, discussion, if that's all right. And Deirdre, if you would join the panel, there are questions coming in. There's some great responses and, and comments. I had a lovely one in there from 
from a participant to say, um, you know, we can really see self-management support in action. Congratulations to Fanula. So Fanula is a big fan club building here for her and her work and for those who have been involved in, in training her uh, uh, Bula Boss uh, uh, for that. A uh, number of questions coming in for people who've already uh, uh, spoken, but I want to turn to the panel. Uh, I want to uh, Orla is going to join us, Deirdre is, is, is staying with us, um, and I will be coming to Pat Healy, National, Clinical, National Director for Clinical Programme Implementation and Professional Development with the HSE, and also hoping to get to Derville Howley, who's Head of Service Health and Wellbeing with HSE. But I want to welcome now uh, Ted Hayes. And Ted is 86. He lives in a nursing home. He's a patient representative from COPD Support Ireland. And Ted has a unique personal insight on the impact of his COPD on his life and the impact of the application of the self-management principles we've been talking about and hearing about uh, and what he has learned during his pulmonary uh, rehab. Ted, can I come to you first, if I may? You're very welcome. Thanks for waiting around all afternoon for this. Can you talk to me a bit about your own story and how the services you've received have supported you to manage your COPD journey? Thank you, Anya. Yes, at this stage in the program, I think a lot of people have stolen my clothes, but I'll give you what I, I'll give you what I have. Could I just start off by saying, I, well, I'd like to show you this, a coil, a coin on both sides. On one side, it says, my father's death certificate stated heart failure due to bronchial asthma. I used to watch him hang on railings or any other support fighting for breath, while people skirted around him, thinking him drunk. I wanted to shout, that's my dad, he can't breathe. He died age 55. Contrast that with a few years ago, I had a stent fitted and was advised to join a seven week exercise and information course. Works for General provided this life enhancing course. In recent years, I've had more stents and was advised by St. Vincent's Hospital to join an ongoing exercise management by, managed by COPD in Balali, Dundrum. We've been going more than three years and during COVID reverted to Zoom. The aftercare and information has been amazing. Thank you to all you lovely medical people for all your efforts in trying to keep me out of hospital. It's working. And may I say, if I may give you a little bit of advice, one of your greatest weapons is information. Thank you. Well said. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ted. Uh, eloquent and I think also uh, heartwarming. Uh, thank you so much for, for your input at, at this part of our webinar. Um, uh, lots of questions have come in for people. I want to just get people whose voice we haven't heard yet this afternoon, and then I'll come to some of the questions for earlier panelists. Gerald, can I come to yourself uh, first of all, and maybe you just talk to us about how the HSE self-management support programmes supports the implementation of integrated care within the enhanced community care programme. Thanks, Amelia Gronia. And uh, just to acknowledge at the start, in terms of Orla O'Reilly and Dr. Carmen Milani and Marie Gleason, who would have been to the fore developing uh, the HSE self management support program, they were really instrumental in terms of securing resources for nine self management support coordinators, one of which is in each of their community health organisations. Um, the remit, and they came under the, uh, the National Self-Management Support Framework, so that same framework that we were talking about earlier mm. in terms of the, the um, training programmes with the higher education also looked at putting in place these self-support coordinators. Um, a little bit like what Fanula was saying, it's around aware, arising awareness in terms of the importance of self-management support and also self-management support in the management of chronic disease. And Ted said there, information is key for us. Um, and uh, it is around kind of their role, uh, creating awareness and supporting 
new service developments and awareness of the existing services of how people can manage their health and to live well. So they're engaged with both the acute hospitals, with the community and with the voluntary sectors as well. The very first task in coming into role was to map those services and provide information, service directories about how to access both condition specific as well as generic self-management support. A few people have mentioned the Living Well programme. It's mm. a six week free programme. It's evidence based. Um, it's available right across the country, so our self-management support coordinators lead out on this. Um, it's supported by Slauncher Care, um, and the online is available across the country and then face-to-face -face in six of our counties. The self-management support coordinators have worked collaboratively as well, so they have a national self-management support coordination team. Orla described in terms of the enhanced community care structures now at regional and local level, and our coordinators form part of those teams. So they're on their steering groups and on the local implementation teams as well. They, they've developed a huge range of supports that are available online on the HSE website. So that's www.hse.ie backslash self-management. And these supports are both for individuals who are living with a long-term chronic condition, supports and resources of how to self-manage, as well as for other health professionals. Uh, so a really good guide and I'd really uh, um, uh, support people to look at um, accessing those on that website. And Thanks. they've worked with they worked at the National Clinical Programmes just in terms of inputting into the education and support videos for the likes of pulmonary rehab um, and developing on the National uh, Services Directory Programme. So quite a significant amount of work, as I said, for nine individuals, one in each of the uh, HSE community health organisations. Uh, they've shown quite a uh, significant leadership during COVID, so when everything was closed down, and particularly for those with long-term conditions uh, that couldn't meet face-to-face, -face, so developing the programmes that could go online and then developing resources, which you'll find on that website as well. So very good. Uh, thanks a million. That's great. Thanks. Thanks very much for that. Pat, can I bring you in here? You're very welcome. From your perspective on the Enhanced Community Care Programme, how does this curriculum support the delivery of enhanced community care? Can I just say I, I'm, I'm heartened uh, having participated in the programme. I mean, we, we all heard at the beginning there in the minister's contribution how he sees this as kind of radical change and strategically important. Uh, but I have to say that in all I've heard today, uh, the curriculum is already uh, being very successful uh, and it's having a significant, significant impact, I think, in, it, it, on what's going on already and yeah. uh, bringing this whole approach and, uh, into the system. Uh, and I suppose our focus on integrating care and uh, coordinating care and early intervention and prevention, I guess, uh, is something that I heard really there. And, you know, the radical change has to do with new ways of working and team working and culture is at the centre of that. And I think a culture of um, addressing prevention from an early point is really important. And I think the curriculum is going to be hugely important. He's already helping in that and I think will be really important going forward. So, so, so for me, I think that's important. I think also enhancing community care is something that we're particularly focused on. But I, I think it's really uh, important to recognise also I suppose with my other hat on around professional development across the organization. Mm. Um, I, I, I think that um, I've already seen, if you look at general practice, for instance, the curriculum and the making every contact count, that's already been very successful there. So that's a whole other group of professionals and it's yeah. relevant, I think, right across our health system. Mm. And so while we have a particular focus on ECC, I think the curriculum is, is something and the training and education focus is, is really important right across our system. So I just want to congratulate yourselves, congratulate the work that's um, been going on with the HAIs. Uh, and, and certainly from our point of view, you can take it that we're fully committed to this and we'll be continuing to, to support um, uh, as we go. And I think um, listening to Ted there as well, I suppose, just brings it back to what this is all about. Uh, and I, I think the curriculum and the work that's been done will assist us in centering it around um, you know, staff focused on, on, on patients and service users and local communities. And I, I think that's really important. So yeah. I'm very heartened by all that I'm, I'm hearing and delighted to be participating.
That's great, Pat. Thanks so much for that. And again, some messages coming in from participants saying, um, you know, Ted, the wonderful voice of the patient, amazing work. Great to see you looking so well. Um, we've got some a couple of questions. Uh, Orla, maybe you could answer, answer this one. How can uh, patients get information regarding what GPs in their area have chronic disease management programs in place? That's an interesting one. You're, you're just on mute there, Orly. You'll have to unmute yourself. That probably is the most famous phrase for the whole of COVID. You're yes, on mute yes. there. <laughs> Should have known by now, shouldn't I? <laughs> um, in fact, 91% of all GPs across the country are running the chronic disease management program. Okay. Um, so it's, and the ones that aren't, from what we understand, are the usually very small practices, maybe with just yep. one GP. Yeah. So yeah. the vast majority of people whose GPs will be running it. Very good. OK, that's great. Um, uh, uh, also for Denise, um, is anyone monitoring outcomes? Yeah, this is a really good <laughs> question. Uh, so, yeah, the answer is yes. I suppose there will be national metrics that will have come down, which are at the moment quite logistical in nature. So time from entry of hub since event, et cetera. Mm. Uh, but then what we've done with the rollout is actually embed outcome measure specifics exactly. um, within each program. So we're rolling out PPPGs or standard operating procedures per area or per condition. And within those, there's a defined outcome measure. They're mm. hugely evidence based and they're aligned with um, what we would expect should hopefully occur and again I think that's where you'll bring in the patient voice as well because for instance a heart failure patient if you can increase their met value you know their functional capacity their their yeah. um, exercise tolerance by one met you'll actually decrease their cardiovascular disease um, from anything right, from so 15 that. to 18 percent so that's really what's important to the patient so we're trying to do a two-pronged approach yeah. catch our logistical ones fulfill our national metrics um, and obviously as further come down from national we'll, we'll work to do that but then really hone in on program specific metrics very good um, yeah. okay so so the answer is yes, yes. it is being monitored yes um, can, can we see a point where the curricula that we've focused on today where they'll be mandatory for all health professionals i mean we're already hearing others in the non-specific health professional area are looking to 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 copy deirdre your sense of yeah, I, th I think um, the, probably the driver around that is going to be our accreditation yeah. uh, committees and, and uh, professional organizations, to be honest, Grania. Yeah. You know, the, like, as I say, the motivation commitment is there from the educators. But usually if something is included in under the accreditation standards, uh, then it, it's more likely then to, to get really embedded and, and also to get the resources. So yeah. I think that's the solution. Yeah. And we have had some, you know, um, Orlith will tell you, we've had some initial meetings, but I think that's probably something we need to go back and do again is probably, you know, get, get that up and running and, and get them included in the standards. OK, and then uh, questions come in. Hi, all. Could anyone advise us how we could use the resources and expertise available to reach out to GP nurses across the country? This huge workforce of about 23,000 nurses are already knee deep in chronic disease management with no structured educational pathways and very limited access to existing programmes. So is this about refresher, retraining, getting people to do those kinds of programs. I don't know who wants to take that one, Orla maybe, or-, or, or Yeah, I, I might Orla. try that one. Um, yeah. we, we've adapted the uh, MIC training program uh, for the ICGP uh, continuing education website. So that's where the GPs get their, you know, their training on MIC from. And my understanding is that the GP practice nurses have access to that as well. Okay, and very equally, good. of course, it is available on HSC, the HSC site. Yeah, um, I'd like to ask a question regarding ensuring student placements in primary care. It's essential students experience the new enhanced community care clinical curriculum has not been mentioned, but it's essential if students are to feel confident to work in these posts as future practitioners. How are student placements going to be guaranteed? That's a very specific. Deirdre, is that your field? Well, it's certainly, really, yes, it's it's certainly an issue, I suppose, that we grapple with hugely growing. It's, it's always getting placements, particularly primary care. It's, it's just a little bit more tricky. Yeah. But I, I do feel that this is, if we want the students to engage 
and to, 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 for educators to see the, the ongoing importance, we've got to get those student placements. And, and, uh, and in fact, at the moment, we are negotiating um, with the, um, the chronic disease hubs in, in CH09, and we're trying to get a pilot project funded for three years yeah. for an interprofessional uh, placement tutor that would support students uh, and, and again really support that integrated uh, mm. uh, multidisciplinary working so um the, the the whole idea of the, the commitment to placements is core i think to yeah. the future success and and there was a question in around you know there were other um disciplines and and in terms of their involvement and hei commitment to including kind of diagnostic related professionals um, and again, we've the, the problem isn't us taking numbers, to be honest, the, it, it's our issue and our difficulty is always that we, we have to, students have to do their placements. So, exactly. So yeah. That's the piece we need to really focus on, I think, to, to, to maintain this momentum. Thanks, Deirdre. Pat, did you want to come in yeah, there? Yeah, I just might say that, that because that, I just want to support that and to say that we've been, you know, uh, we struggled with this to some degree. There's a real recognition at a top level within the organisation now uh, and within the department that this has to be tackled effectively. And so our new um, COO, David McCallion, is making a particular effort uh, with a team across the um, operational uh, and, and uh, corporate side ourselves and others uh, to, to try and tackle that commencing this year in a more significant way uh, to address the, the points that have just been made because it's it's fully understood we, we have to get the placements yeah the exactly that struggle with and and just to say that 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 is you now um being supported uh, hopefully and we want to try and resource it effectively yeah i have um maybe a final one here pat is a diabetes cns currently working in integrated care seeing patients in their gp practices when the service moves fully to the hub, is there an option to see patients living a long distance from the hub closer to their homes? Yeah, so I might, yeah, I might take that one. So the concept is most of the hubs, I believe, are running in a hub and spoke. So the concept yeah. is you'll you'll effectively have a more specialized centered area. So the diagnostics, the mm. more advanced um, respiratory testing, etc. But then that we'll actually travel out. out. Yeah, yeah, like for instance, here in Galway, some of our networks, patients can be living about 70 kilometers away from the actual hospital. So, you know, clinics are going to them um, and that's mm. happening already. Um, portable spirometry, when that comes on board the whole concept um but that the clinicians will have a base um obviously to come back to within the hub for their yeah. mdt their case yeah. conferences etc yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly great and great questions from yeah. uh, our our uh, participants and audience this afternoon look many thanks to each of our guests here today the panelists the people who did the pre-record interviews um it's been a really busy webinar with fantastic information and i think as pat has said just to to say well done to everyone this is a huge development i think it is one of those big turning points uh, for the 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 uh, reform and for uh, patients to really see the changes that have been happening and to feel the benefits so it's wonderful to be able to showcase this this afternoon thanks to all the team here who helped to produce this session to Rosaline Harlan a big thanks to Dr Maria O'Brien uh, Tom Duke you can watch this webinar back or recommend it to your colleagues it will be available on the Sloan to Care website so from me uh, Gronje Healy, please continue to stay safe and we'll see you next time. Thank you all very, very much. Thanks, Gronje. Take care. Bye.